Fast forward to 2009, Neon was really taking a nosedive at this point. All the shops in town, they all closed them at the same time due to this LED in insurge. I was one of the casualties of that. And so I was, I took a little break in Neon and I was doing, I was working as a professional animator for a video game company and trying, I was hustling, just trying to put work together. And Dennis called me and he said he's retiring and he wanted to sell me the business. And I was the first person he thought of and I was in, financially I was in the worst place to say yes, but emotionally and in my career, I was in the best place to say yes. So, and um, I've been here since. Hello, disclaimer here. There's something I have to tell you before we can begin. The information provided by Taming Lightning is designed to provide helpful information and to educate on the subjects discussed. That being said, the information provided is true and complete to the best of our knowledge and is not intended to be used without professional guidance or supervision. All recommendations are made in good faith by both Taming Lightning and affiliates, to which we disclaim any liability in connection to the use of the information we provide. Thus, we ask that you be informed be curious, and to ask questions. Let's get to it. Welcome back and welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II, your host for Taming Lightning, as well as the independent plasma tech at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, where I'm researching and developing a space for exploring plasma and neon light art. This is a process requiring the technical and artistic expressions of glass blowing with the alchemical and scientific application of electrified gases and specialized equipment that you would also find used in neon. Self-study in this field has led me to a growing network of experts and institutions that allow for conversations with artists, makers, and experts related to plasma, neon, glass, and beyond. Through these conversations, I hope to expand our understanding of plasma and neon light, looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential for noble gases as an artistic medium, and of course, have fun making and sharing what I learned along the way. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Glass Art Society. Since 1971, the Glass Art Society has been using the joy of glass to connect, inspire, and empower all facets of the global glass community. From the early days of the American Studio Glass Movement to the upcoming United Nations International Year of Glass, GAS continues to foster connections across generations, disciplines, and borders. Join them in celebrating 50 years of Glass Art Society as they present the 2022 GAS Conference in Tacoma, Washington, USA, from May 18th through the 21st. With a theme, Between Here and There, this milestone conference will explore the past 50 years of glass and what the next 50 years holds for making, collecting, and educating. Visit glassart.org today to learn more and register. And for those both interested in and working with illuminated glass, be it neon, plasma, or otherwise, I'm here to inform you that the Plasma Art Alliance will be hosting a book premiere for Wayne Stradman's new book, The Art of Plasma, creating lighted sculptures with gas, glass, and electricity during the 2022 Glass Art Society Conference. Stratman reveals the history, theory, and practice of plasma art to give the practitioner both the context and practical information to work within this dynamic medium. To celebrate the first book dedicated to the medium of plasma sculpture, join us Thursday, May 19th from 5 to 7 p.m. at Spaceworks downtown location at 1120 Pacific Avenue in Tacoma. All are welcome. Book copies will be in limited supply, and details can be found in the show notes on taminglightning.net. Hello, Lightning Tamers. This is episode number 47, 
And I'm here with Thomas Zicker of Neon Lab and Neon Instructor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thomas Zicker is a neon glass mixed media artist based out of Madison, Wisconsin, and has been a neon glass blower for nearly 20 years, though he has been an active artist his entire life. After finishing his degree in fine art sculpture from University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, Tom moved to Boulder, Colorado and took on an intensive four-year apprenticeship in neon. After the foundation for neon had been laid, he, his wife Christine, and their dogs moved to Madison, Wisconsin, where Tom continued to learn and grow in the craft of neon. Thomas also studied and practiced design and animation and continues to work and create in all three fields. In 2010, Thomas was contacted by a longtime friend and fellow worker, Dennis Eckstein, about purchasing a business called Neon Lab, which had been established in 1999. Putting his life savings on the line, Tom did not hesitate to take on this opportunity. Along with running Neon Lab, Thomas also teaches a course called Neon Light as Sculpture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison a fine art-based neon program that puts an emphasis on the creative side of glass blowing and neon being used as sculpture. Tom has facilitated and curated many shows throughout the university for students and professional artists alike. Thomas currently has original work in the Milwaukee Art Museum, as well as shown work in MoMA New York City and MoMA San Francisco and the Schaliger Art Museum in Basel, Switzerland. Tom was fortunate to be included as one of the three current glass benders working for the contemporary American artist, Bruce Nauman. Neon Lab is going strong. It is a small operation with a big heart. And Thomas is dedicated to the craft of neon and is working to ensure its future is bright and colorful. Welcome to the podcast, Tom. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, it's pretty um, interesting here is that um, the thing that really stood out to me first and foremost was just thinking about your, your background. Like, what drew you to take on neon amongst your, you know, interest in arts and sculpture and things of that sort? Yeah, that's, it's funny, actually, when I was in my undergrad program, I didn't really know anything about neon there was no glass program where I was. I just mainly did foundry work and did a lot of sculpture with clay. I knew I wanted to work with my hands. And when I was out of school, I was just searching for a path, as many young people do. And I happened to be at a restaurant and saw neon signs all over this restaurant. And for whatever reason, it caught my eye, as neon does. And at that moment, I just decided this is what I'm going to do. And I put my basically foot on the gas and uh, never looked back. <laughs> this was um, this is pre-internet. This was um, very old school research, by the way. You had to go to the library and look in phone books, et cetera, et cetera. So, wow. And, and where did you end up apprenticing at? So it was um, <laughs> again. It, it was a very indirect path. I ended up finding a basically on the job training program and it was a very informal program that's a loose word at a place called Xeon Glassworks and what it was was a very large production neon production facility that made window signs window mm -hmm. signs that shipped all over the country and even all over the world and they didn't put me right into the glass room that's for sure it was a couple years of assembling and shipping and designing and just a lot of broom pushing to finally gain their trust to let me get into the neon department, the glass blowing department. Hmm. There seems to be sort of a odd parallel. I mean, I, I come from also uh, I come from a uh, martial arts background, where sometimes um, the idea of kind of getting into a school or mastery sometimes involves this kind of um, culture of kind of clean the floors before someone accepts your dedication before you learn anything uh, sort of deal. 
and it seems to be pretty common um, amongst um, er earlier uh, your earlier generations of getting into neon and and getting into that trade. That's very true. Um, as you know very well, and as many who are probably listening, neon is a really tricky craft to learn. There's a huge learning curve to it. And my main goal was survival, as, again, many of our goals are, is paying bills, paying rent, etc. And so you need a job. And there is not an employer in the world that is going to take somebody with zero experience and give them a living wage making neon, not when it takes a couple of years, you know, minimum of full-time work to really kind of get caught up to make producible work. And so you kind of have to just hold your breath and take your time. And I jumped into it, not on an artistic level. I jumped into it in a very commercial level. Mm -hmm. And the standards were very, very high where I worked at. And it was, it was pretty brutal to be honest with you. Yeah. And unlike um, some of the people I've got run into who have come out of academic programs that have provided access to neon um, when you're working in an apprenticeship in the regards of commercial work, you have to learn a lot of skills as well as a lot of technical, um, you know, business-related tasks. As you mentioned, shipping and packing and pattern work and, and things of that sort and installing. Um, is this something that, and I've kind of started getting ahead of myself a little bit as I travel through your, your, your timeline, but is that something that you introduce in the scope of academics to, to realize there's more to it than just bending and making the art that you also have to understand the inst installation aspect. Yeah, yeah, actually it's true. And I do to a certain point. So as you mentioned in that uh, kind intro, I also work at UW Madison as an adjunct instructor in neon and a semester is a very short amount of time to teach the entire, the entire scope of this craft of neon. So what I base the first third of the semester is on fundamentals and there's a lot of fundamental tests and skills tests. And then we go on to original projects and along with those projects come installation and fabrication, some assembly and handling of the glass. And it goes without saying there's usually a little bit of drama that comes along with it, but it's mm -hmm. also, it's one of the really key great points of this program is it teaches problem solving and just some skills that, oh, I don't know, 11 out of 12 students after every semester may never do neon again, but they certainly have some uh, really good experiences coming out of it. Yeah, that's always tough when it comes to education. How do you, um, how do you survey appropriately the, the scope of of a of a, a field so that students um, can ignore some can bypass their own ignorance and realize there's more to this than the 16 weeks that you get, which is actually just less than 16 weeks if you come, uh, go with like uh, holiday breaks and such. So you're not getting yeah, your full scope of your 16 weeks. No, but at the level that I'm teaching, which I'm generally teaching due to um, just the nature of this class, I'm teaching fourth and fifth year seniors and graduate students. Mm. And so they're smart human beings to begin with. They've been through, they've already been through a lot, meaning they know how a semester works. It's very rapid. Mm -hmm. And I, they're basically kind of expected to spend minimum of 10 hours a week in the lab. And sometimes outside of class time, maybe up to 15 or 20, mm -hmm. depending on. So, so for one class, generally, out of, if they have four or five classes, they're expected quite a bit of time to, to put into this. So, and they they enjoy it. They keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, they definitely. It's definitely something that once you experience it, you you either have the bug or you're just you have a great appreciation. There's no, there's you, you. Hopefully, you leave a program or leave a class where it's there's there's a respect that's gained, whether or not you could pursue it in the future or not. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. It, w when you talk about your apprenticeship, about how much of that involved bending, 
for you? Um, for me personally, if I say loosely, I, I worked at this company for just under five years. Um, I bet you two and a half years was bending. And however, this particular company, since it was such a high production facility, they paid basically on a piece rate where every bend that you got, you get a successful bend, you get paid for. But you didn't get paid for those bends until, say, this is an example, I need to make 10 open signs. Mm -hmm. And every bend had to pass a quality inspection, and you wouldn't get paid for those 10 signs, like, say, 35 cents a bend. You wouldn't get paid for those 10 signs until all 10 passed. Mm -hmm. And so for my first year or year and a half, they paid me minimum wage just because they were legally obligated to because I could not make more than minimum wage mm -hmm. with their stringent, um, their stringent quality control. Mm. But then after, you know, after a couple of years, I caught on and I started getting better and I started getting faster and I was able to just get it up to a few dollars an hour. And that's basically how my apprenticeship worked. I was very fortunate. There were seven under seven, excuse me, seven other benders working there and they were all very kind and helpful. They were all doing their job, making their living, but they liked me and they gave me tips and I watched them and I learned through observation. And that's also where I learned about bombarding because you do as a beginning bender, you do a lot of the bombarding mm -hmm. before you do really any production work. So got to keep the engine running. That's right. <laughs> that's right. There's, there's, there's many wheels in this big, uh, many gears in this big machine. So now, like dipping into a little bit of more of a personal uh, question here, did you meet your wife while you were in in school, and then, or was it during the apprenticeship? Because there's there's a there's no. a narrative here that I'm watching, and I'm I'm trying to to understand a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a fair question. I actually met my wife when I was done with college, but before I moved halfway across the country for Neon. <laughs> she when I when we met we were just dating and she said she was moving to Colorado and essentially I chased her out there and um, <laughs> the, the rest was history. So, and she was, uh, she's been very patient with me all these years and through the ups and downs and, and through everything about it. So, Look at that, a neon so she, story. she, yeah, she was, she was going to graduate school at um, CU in Boulder when I started working at this neon shop. So, but that was a little extra motivation to do your best in the neon field so you could stick around. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I made the commitment to myself and to my wife and to my family that this is my living. And when you don't give yourself a plan B, that's what you have to do. And that's what I did. And I've been doing it since. Mm. Minus a few small breaks in between yeah. here and there, but. And then could you tell me a little bit about Dennis Eckstein and your relationship? Yeah. With him? Um, he, so I moved to Madison, uh, Wisconsin, and I had never lived here before. And it's a, it's a, I guess, a small city basically. And um, I started looking for neon work when I got here and I, I worked together. I worked piecemeal on neon jobs all around the area. And Dennis was, I don't know, 15 or 20 years older than me when I got here, which he, I guess mathematically he still would be 15 or 20 years older than me. But he was um, a solo bender. He didn't work for a big shop. He worked for himself. And just over the following 10 years, we became friends. We just through working in the same field and Friday afternoons, I would go and see him and we have a beer or whatever. And fast forward to 2009 Neon was really taking a nosedive at this point. Um, all the shops in town, there might have been a half a dozen or six or eight shops in town that had neon plants. Mm -hmm. They all closed them at the same time due to this LED yeah. um, in, in surge that we all know about. Yeah. And I was, I was one of the casualties of that. And so I was, I took a little break in neon and I was doing, I was working as a professional animator for a video game company and trying, I was hustling, just trying to put work together. 
And Dennis called me and he said he's retiring and he wanted to sell me the business. Mm. And I was the first person he thought of. And I was in financially, I was in the worst place to say yes, but emotionally and in my career, I was in the best place to say yes. So, Mm -hmm. and, um, I've been here since, uh, self-employed one person shop going on 12 years this summer that I've been doing it. And he was here for 12 years before that. Mm. So, and as it turns out, due to attrition in the, in the neon trade, this is the only glass shop in, you know, uh, probably a greater area of a million people. And actually stretching down to Chicago and Milwaukee, mm, wow. I get um, work. So because all the shops just, close their plants so now they all bring me their service work and if there's new work they bring me and I um I market and sell new work as well in the form of window signs mm-hmm. so in your case you just rode out the storm long enough to to, to be able to show to shine the light Ex- exactly exactly and that goes back to oh, not man. having a plan b and um a long time ago and this is just working just being in the arts I would always read about other artists and listen for advice and not just in glass, but in, you know, if you're an illustrator or if you're a ceramicist, there's, there's ways to make livings, but it's not an easy road Mm -hmm. on any level to make a living with your hands. And I believe it was Robert Williams, who is a, he's a graphic illustrator, um, founder of Juxtapose magazine. And he just said, keep your head down, keep working. And if you're good at your job, good things will happen. And that's all I did. And I just kept trying to get better and better and kept trying to improve my work. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, you know, thinking about that, it's, you know, we often try to assign like some kind of, you know, beautiful scripture to, uh, you know, riding out uh, nature, like the change in, in interest and the, the the rise of other um, you know, more efficient technologies or more uh, uh, abundant technologies. You know, you can't stop those. It's like trying to stop the storm. And sometimes the the only, the most basic thing is, you know, we hear a lot of this nowadays, grit or, you know, having the will and, and the mental fortitude, the stillness, the stoneness to, um, to keep steady and move forward through it all. And then things just change. I mean, we could kind of reference a little bit to our current predicament in this COVID-19 pandemic and the roller coaster ride that is and the difference between today and that first moment in March of 2020. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, there is my in my experience, everybody's experience is a little different. Right. And my experience is it is it's a tough road if you want to work by yourself, work in the crafts in a non traditional field. It's not impossible, but I don't it's not easy for anybody. Um and then fast forwarding to COVID, boy, I don't have a I don't know what to say about that. That's I've been I guess I've been pretty lucky because mm-hmm. I haven't had to obviously lay anybody off or I wasn't laid off. I just didn't have work. That's all there is to it. There's, right. When you're self, when you're self employed and the phone stops ringing, there's no assistance. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's no, there's no office to go talk to. It's just, you got to figure it out and, you know, and I guess uh, make a pivot and, do, do something else. Yeah. And I've been pretty fortunate because I've had just enough work to kind of grind through. So, yeah. Yeah. Like for me, I, I, you know, picking up on, you know, the early disappearance of, of neon, uh, in the area that you're in, I've observed shops disappear here in Pittsburgh area. Um, right now there's only really two, uh, shops, you know, one is, Tim Takis and and then both Tim and Hugh Elliott share that that space, um, and then there's Neon Doctor, 
Um, some of the other surrounding neon shops have been slowly closing out, and then we're just decimated um, by COVID-19 and, and the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's really sad to hear. And then if you can't make a living at it, you just need to figure something out. And that's a real bummer, obviously. And then, and then also people are retiring yeah. and they just had enough. So I'm, hey. I'm really thrilled. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, Percy. sorry. I was going to say, you know, just going to blur about that. Yeah. It's a combination of, well, longstanding businesses and no new blood, new, no new fresh faces into the field. And then retiring is primary. A lot of it that's happening right now. It, it is a pretty old medium, and in its heyday in our lifetime, which was, I don't know, 80s, 90s, even into the early 2000s, when it was still just being widely produced for signage, you were able to work. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's, a different, it's a different challenge now, that's for sure. Yeah. Today's podcast is sponsored by Fluxion Induction Heat by Garrett Churchill. Fluxion is a small, family-run company out of San Diego, California. They specialize in induction heating solutions for annealing brass and all manner of brazing, soldering, and heat treating. The neon version of the Annie heater is perfect for converting neon electrodes in both conventional neon tubes as well as plasma art pieces. For more information, please email Garrett Churchill at sales at fluxion.com or give them a call at 858 699-6096 699-6096 or visit our website at fluxion.com that's f-l-u-x-e-o-n dot com and part of what I want to do and have been working towards is pulling it into public access through the Pittsburgh Glass Center um, which is been a long learning journey for myself as I try to understand what hasn't been successfully done in it, uh, uh, in the field of education or public studios is to bring neon into a space that is most appropriate for it. I mean, there, everyone's got their little shops. They teach maybe a couple people. You got other studios that add the program to an existing space, but it's so crammed into this area you know, I'm, I'm looking to, to learn from everyone's um, situations and, and, and find opportunities to build and not just uh, copy and paste into a space. And I'm not saying yeah, that their, their decisions great. are bad or that they're doing anything wrong. They were doing what they had to make it so that they could do this. But I don't want to fall to fall to a st- to what we see. I want to go beyond that to learn from the things they wish they had or wish they could do. With the opportunities here at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Sure, sure. And a little bit of that's happened it's, through Wisconsin Madison, right? Uh, y- yeah, and I've been. Uh, now I, I will say I've been pretty lucky. I'm in the right place at the right time, living here where I am, um, with this giant university here, with the nation's oldest studio glass program, for one thing. Mm-hmm. Yep, and and then in the '80s, I believe um, the current the the person the gentleman who was running the glass program got together. His name was Steve Farron. Got to ne- together with a, um, a gentleman's name Fred Chita from Alfred University, mm. and they both put their heads together and said, "We want to introduce neon into our glass programs." And at that point, Alfred in upstate New York and Madison here became sort of like sister schools with glass in their studio glass program. And they both opened a neon shop. And over the years, those neon shops would open and close because as you know, Mm -hmm. and as again, it's most people listening, a neon plant is super fussy. It's very finicky Mm -hmm. and they would constantly break down and it's difficult to service them. It's difficult to get people to fix them. And so they just were kind of on and off for about 25 years. And then, oh, no, maybe 10 years ago, the some grad students got together at UW-Madison and got it fixed up, got the program revitalized, went through a few teachers, 
And then I got the opportunity to jump in and have just been running with it since. Hmm. Since you've been uh, teaching there, um, has there been upgrades that you've made to the space or for the for the, the neon classes? Have there been changes to the studio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's also, I'm just super fortunate where the, the popularity of this class has been growing and growing and growing, and that's not unnoticed by the school. And they tore down some walls and they doubled our workspace size and we doubled our benches and we've been able to keep really nice processing equipment. Just, um, it's not, I don't have blank checks to buy equipment. You have to be very careful, but that's how neon studios work. Mm -hmm. Generally equipment will last a lifetime if it's taken care of. Right. And we're getting really close to having stuff dialed in with the torches we have 12 students in the class per semester and that's really it's actually pushing it yeah that, um, that it's pushing it. big <laughs> yeah it's it's pushing it for my own um workload and sanity as well as just elbow room in that room it's not a gigantic space but it's it's top of the line as far as ventilation goes and it's really nice and through that, and as, um, as many know that if you have a nice space to work in, it's just that much easier to have incentive to work harder and work more and produce really nice work. Yeah. I got to see a few uh, sneak peeks from Helen who sent me some pictures. I really like the cable and co- cable management and the spacing that you guys uh, adapted. It looks really good. It looks comfortable. looks um, manageable. Yeah, it's it's important when you have, you know, several people walking around with four foot sticks of glass yeah. and you, you, you just need a little bit of room. That's all. So. Now, you also mentioned in in your um, in your bio there that you are one of a few artists that fabricate for or a, a few vendors, I should say, specifically that works for works with the artist um, Bruce Nauman. Uh, How did that come about you becoming one of those benders? Yeah, that's another, that was another great opportunity um, through gentleman Jacob Fishman out of Chicago. I love Jacob. Uh, He is just, he's one of the best human beings on the planet. He's just awesome. And Jacob and I have known each other for a few years, casually, just from being in the same business. We've done some shows together and Jacob has known and worked with Bruce Nauman since the eighties. Mm, yeah. And he goes, he goes back and Bruce did a lot of work through Chicago back in the day. And that's how Jacob got into his wheelhouse. And this last, um, it was a big retrospective at MoMA in 2018. So in 2017, Jacob reached out to me and said, well, I'm putting together a small team and would I be interested? And started sending me patterns, and it was it was a lot of patterns. So, <laughs> so um, I, I learned a lot about Bruce Nauman. I learned about him. Um, when you work on somebody else's work like that, you almost get to know them intimately. And I started understanding his work more and more every day. I worked on it, and I would sincerely call myself a fan. So, but not super run-of-the-mill straightforward neon that's for sure i have a new respect yeah, but look- now that neon yeah i'm sorry that neon was up in moma for oh in i think nine months and then it went to switzerland then i believe it bounced back to san francisco after that so and now i think it's all destroyed oh no <laughs> that's like what they do issue? They, or just no just no at, at, yeah, after a show, they do that to preserve the um, the value of a piece, because these were not these were original ideas. And they were they're Bruce Nauman's works, but somebody owns them. They're belie- I believe they're in oh. private collections. So what they do is they commission Jacob and his team, in my case me, to make the neon, and then when the shows are over, it's generally destroyed. 
So that way, nobody can have that and say they have an original piece. I see. And it's, it's all documented. Yeah. So, so this is this is different than making a new piece of work for Bruce. You're making replicas so you can show those works in different places, and then after that show is done, it has to be destroyed because it's not the work that's being that it's not the original work. It's meant to just show the work in a different location. Yes, okay. yes. the the work we, The work we made was, I believe, was originally made in the early '80s, mm -hmm. maybe even maybe even the '70s. So, and to be honest with you, I don't know where that work even is this day. It's somewhere vaulted i'm sure yeah so i never even thought about that i mean there's a lot of things you don't actually get to talk about or, or think about when it comes to art when you're going through even an academic program or as your own but it, it makes it makes sense like there's some people that have collected the work and how do you get that work from one person to that person to show somewhere else especially something like neon which is very fragile right you can't just expect to ship it all over the place and expect it to come back in one piece. So that's that's very fascinating. Yeah. I, I never even thought about yeah. that. Yeah, and and the the logistics of them getting this neon from Chicago to New York City, then to Basel, Switzerland, just the logistics of it were crazy. It was pretty cool how they did it. And they didn't really they didn't cut any corners in packaging and shipping it. But some neon did break on the way to Switzerland, and apparently that was a whole um, comical snafu getting it repaired. Mm. European glass bending is quite a bit different than North American glass bending. Yeah. So I wonder if uh, if maybe Tommy Gooseshull was assisting in that. I I, I don't think so, <laughs> but um, his name certainly came up in the conversation. So <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Wow, so we're almost we're pretty much caught up to today. In that regards, um, you know, we talked about how you were able to expand on the studio uh, where Neon is at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and um, uh, I guess what I can ask now is: is the work a little bit better today than it was maybe last year? Or how does that look for you? And what type of things do you typically get nowadays? Um, yeah, that's a good question, and it's it's kind of a difficult question to answer. Meaning, I um, I kind of have the Lucille Ball theory to my business, where if I'm busy today, it's great. But if I look at my schedule and I don't have anything in two weeks, that's when I worry, because that's kind of how it works for me. And I'm I'm slow and steady at my shop or not even slow, I'm certainly steady, but I'm in, I'm in my second or the third quarter or the third, I'm sorry, the last third of my semester. So that's very busy at school mm -hmm. and I'm gearing up. I'm going to be teaching a class again. I'm going to be teaching a summer class at UW Madison this summer. And that it's supposed to be a quarter job. It's, so not even, you know, not even a part-time job, but it definitely takes up more time than that. So it mm -hmm. keeps me very busy and I enjoy that. Um, my work has changed at my personal shop quite a bit over the years due to, I don't have nearly as much service work as I once did, meaning uh, if there's um, a business that has a large neon, it has a large sign and you don't even know it's neon because there's plastic faces over it channel letters nowadays those are all if they're not brand new led signs they've been converted to led signs from neon mm. and so up until a few years ago that was a huge part of my job was doing service work and now the service work is all but gone so i rely on custom window signs okay and i'm bringing in work yeah i bring in work from all over well all over the greater area like i said from madison to chicago to milwaukee People will come to me for window signs. So that keeps me busy, definitely. And I have a couple of those on that I'm going to be starting oh, this week, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, you keep you keep but, busy somehow, you know. <laughs> yeah, you just keep your head down and keep working, and it's going to happen, basically. Yeah. So, so and 
this there's always and I hate to say this and it's just is the bane of my existence, but there's always beer signs to be fixed too. So <laughs> that that's something Tim always collects and cleans up and resells. It's kind of the thing that he does nowadays. Yeah, I don't um not many not many neon vendors really like doing it. Some do. I just um I think they're too fussy and they just they just take up space and time. But I've just hustled my whole life and I'm never gonna turn away work. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna turn down if somebody needs something fixed, we're gonna fix it. Just takes a while to get to it, that's all. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the important lessons that you um, leave your students with when they finish up a class with you a semester? Um, the, <laughs> that's, it's generally a little more on the broad scale where it's, um, you're going to get out of something what you put into it. That's probably the, that's probably the, the most major lesson. Every one of these students, they come in for the first class. They've never held a four foot stick of neon tubing in their life. They don't know. Everybody starts from the same, from the same step. But when it comes time for our first critique, there is a decided difference between all 12 of these projects. And it's really, really quickly apparent who put in a lot more work, who put in the, you know, least amount of work. Um, Great concepts will take you so far and then hard work will take you so far. But if you're able to focus both of those things together with pre-planning and, and then you just kind of work your tail off, you're going to have a really cool project. And I think that goes much beyond neon. That will go to every aspect of life. Mm-hmm. I agree. Are there any uh, final um things that you would like to say to our audience or say on the podcast today? Well, um, thanks for having me. I really do appreciate it. Um, I really, really am enjoying seeing this. And I will say seeing this very vibrant resurgence in the popularity of neon over the past five or six years. And it's, you know, on the likes of you and Mondo neon and Merrill with the whole she bends movement. It's been nothing but really positive, positive growth in popularity. And because of that, I'm able to, that helps me work and it helps, you know, it's really great for me to be able to share with what I'm learning. Mm-hmm. That and I'm still making, I'm still making, I'm, I'm doing more than teaching and working commercial work too. I'm still just making original work that will be, um, I'm going to be showing in a gallery in Chicago coming up here soon. So it's fun just to keep working and just keep hustling because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Is that the Ken Saunders gallery? Yes, it is. Yes. (laughs) I got eyes everywhere now. I was talking to James and James is also part of that too. And a lot of other um, artists working with light and neon. So cool. Yep. I did a, I did a show with Ken this summer and it went pretty well. And this one's a little scaled down, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But, um, he's a, he's a neat guy too. So, and he likes the medium and we have to, um, we all prop each other up that way. Yeah. Ken, Ken's great. I I got to meet him in my undergrad. We were showing like they, they did this like once a year, uh, undergrad university glass exhibition for like a single day they would do that um, like once a year. And so that's how I got to meet Ken Saunders and the, and they would switch between that gallery and the other gallery, which I can't remember the name of the woman that owns that one. Um, but they would switch on and off every other year. Good people, good people yes. in glass, good yes. people representing artists. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to meet with me for the podcast today. I got to learn a lot more about you, and um, we'll, we'll keep in touch. I'll, I'll be ringing up your phone <laughs> to, to see what you've been up to. Well, thank you, Percy. I appreciate it as well. And um, 
Yep. I look forward to watching uh, the, your growth as well. Very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Taming Lightning Podcast. Music credits to the following artist in order of appearance. Retro by One. Taming Lightning by Trav B. Ryan. Good to Go by One. And Walking by Roz Hop. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. As mentioned at the start of the episode, Tom Zicker has been a recommendation for quite a while. And like many of our guests, there's an interesting story with each and every person. Sometimes what you're passionate about is a gift given to you, or it's an opportunity. Other times you bear all the effort, at least from a limited perspective, it seems to be one or the other. But here we have an example showing both luck, effort, and determination. And I'm happy to see that things have been improving for Tom. Both our situations within the pandemic and its effects worldwide, and I'm no historian, mirrors the late, what the ladies from Neon Nonsense have spoken about, as noted in the 60s by Henry Eccles, regarding the highs and lows in the prevalence of Neon, how there's been a shift of a decrease and an increase throughout time. So it should not be unusual that things will happen based on the events happening in the world or maybe changes in technology, which you can check out in the Neon Nonsense podcast hosted by Allison Buchanan and Daniel James in episode four featuring Robert House, a.k.a. the Neon Archaeologist. Thank you, Tom and Zicker, for your time on the podcast. And I love seeing your recent experiments and troubleshooting on the Neon and Plasma Art for Beginners Facebook group. I recommend checking out the Facebook group Neon and Plasma Art for Beginners. There's always a dozen hands to help, and you may also find some equipment for sale as well. I'd like to thank the Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration. The Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing and supportive people. And lastly, both sponsors in this episode, the Glass Art Society and Garrett Churchill from Fluxion. If you'd like to support Taming Lightning, subscribe to the newsletter on www.taminglightning.net or follow on Instagram at Taming Lightning. Other options for support are one-time donations through Ko-fi, spelled ko-fi.com slash taminglightning. Or you can join me on Patreon for additional perks and benefits. I'll have links provided in the show notes, so feel free to share, comment, and subscribe. And as always, be safe, be informed, and be curious. And I'll see you next time.